Here is a contracts hypothetical that allows us to pay particular attention to what I think may be the most important analytical idea that I have to offer you on this subject, defenses. Look at the call of the question. It asks, what legal arguments could data raise as defenses, and how should the court rule on each? Discuss. Well, it doesn't take long to find out that this is a contracts question, and so we know that a defendant in a contracts case has possible defenses to formation, defenses to breach, and defenses to remedies. And we know that all other civil litigants likely will have at least a defense to the theory of liability and a defense to whatever remedies the plaintiff is seeking. We go to the top of this fairly complicated fact pattern, and in paragraph one, we meet tech. Tech is seeking bids so that it can purchase and have installed complicated equipment for doing tests in the middle of the ocean. In paragraph two, we read about a meeting between data's president, Dan, and the representatives of tech. It looks as if we've got a deal at the end of paragraph two. But we notice, carefully looking at the dates, that this is a contract that can be performed in more than a year. Clearly, the statute of frauds is going to require a writing. And at the end of this second paragraph, we see that data, the party to be charged apparently, never signs this document. So it looks as if there's going to be a, at least a credible defense to formation in this case based on the statute of frauds. Look at the next paragraph. We see a month later, Tech calls data and asks for a modification of the agreement with regard to the time for performance. And we carefully look at that paragraph and we see it has enormous legal implications. For one thing, it looks as if Dan is acknowledging the existence of a binding contract. So even though technically data never signed the deal, it looks as if here Dan is conducting himself as if the contract exists, and it might be enough for the parties to basically have an estoppel situation where data would be stopped from denying the existence of the contract based on the conduct of the president of the company, Dan. He acknowledges the agreement, but look more carefully at the substance of what's going on here. It looks as if Tech is seeking a modification of the agreement and as we consider the law of modifications, we see that there's no writing, so if this is a UCC transaction, it's not going to be a valid modification. But look more carefully and think about the common law of modifications. There's no consideration present either. So we see that this modification, this purported modification, will fail, regardless of which law is going to govern this agreement. And let's pause for a moment and think about that issue. Is this a UCC contract or a common law contract? It's a $28,000 deal. Of that $28,000, $20,000 is the apparent value of the equipment. So one could make a fairly persuasive argument that the overwhelming bulk of this contract is a UCC deal. And furthermore, that both of these parties are merchants. But the way I look at the contract is I judge what makes this contract different from other contracts is the delivery provision. And that's the key reason why Tech signed this deal in the first place. And we know Tech really did sign this deal. And so I think it more reasonable to judge this case based on common law standards rather than the UCC. But under either body of law, this purported modification is going to fail. And the best written answers to questions like this would acknowledge the ambiguities and clearly explain what the appropriate result is. The bottom line is this modification fails, and it fails under the UCC or under the common law, and thus this issue gives us a chance to explain that distinction. Then we move on to the next paragraph. Here we see Delta breaching the agreement by signing a deal with an oil company, and they do it for a clear motive of profit. Now, if this was a UCC deal with fungible goods, it might be possible that they could defend their breach based on the economic value of the breach and being prepared to pay damages. However, they don't really do that. It just looks like a straight example of voluntary disablement, and the phone call from uh, Dan to Tech looks to me as if it is an anticipatory repudiation. 
The guy is basically saying, we're not performing, the deal's off. And so clearly we've got a breach at that point. Finally, in the last paragraph, we see that tech seeks to cover but is unable to find another company that can install this equipment, then they sue for specific performance. So we know what the setup of this case is. We've got a plaintiff suing a defendant to specifically enforce a contract. So structurally, we know what the basic framework of this case is. Formation, defenses to formation. Performance and breach, defenses to breach. Remedies, defenses to remedies. And since we've got a plaintiff seeking equitable relief, we can think up our quick checklist of equitable defenses to equitable remedies. So the question is asking us about defenses. Now, one could write a good answer to this question following the straight contracts format, but it would be difficult to complete on time. If you write your answer focusing on the defenses, discussing defenses to formation, here, defenses to the modification, defenses to breach, and then defenses to specific performance. You could still cover all of the contracts issues well while focusing your attention directly on the call of the question, which in this instance is asking about defenses that would be raised in a specific performance case. So turn the page and take a look at the outline of issues that I've presented. You'll see that what I am doing is directly responsive to the call of the question. I discuss defenses to formation, defenses to the modification, defenses to breach, and defenses to specific performance. With regard to defenses to formation, it's apparent that there is a valid contract here, but data can argue that the statute of frauds requires a writing, and furthermore, it can argue that it never did sign a confirming letter, and since a writing is required, and since the party to be charged, Delta or data, has never signed the agreement, there's no contract and therefore nothing to enforce. I think that to an extent, that is not an unpersuasive argument, but a more careful examination of the facts and of the relationship between these parties indicates that Dan, the president of data, conducted himself as if there was a binding contract. And I think that conduct is good enough to stop this defendant from denying the existence of a valid contract. Next, we turn to the modification. And the reason we turn to it next is because, chronologically, it's the next issue that comes up. And here, we're able to establish, first, that the party is seeking to modify the agreement, but then, despite the fact that Dan, on behalf of Data, agrees, despite that fact, the modification lacked consideration, so if it's a common law contract, the modification fails. Furthermore, the modification was never reduced to a writing. Had it been, that would have been good enough to satisfy the UCC. So although the question itself, in a broader sense, does present a kind of an interesting question about whether or not the UCC or the common law applies to this case, with regard to the modification, we can be sure that it fails under either standard. That requires us to know the law of modification, both under the common law and under the UCC. Now, pause for a moment. Wouldn't you agree that studying a fact pattern like this and thinking your way through it is a much more effective way to learn that distinction than merely studying an outline? So, moving on, it's apparent that there's a binding contract and that the modification did not, did not succeed. So next we turn to the defendant's defense to breach. Here, you really have to scratch your head to think of any defense to breach. The only one that I can come up with is that the lawsuit is premature and that the plaintiff should have waited until performance was due and then filed an action. This allows us to discuss the law of anticipatory repudiation. What are the rights of the non-breaching party when there's been a repudiation by the breaching party? Well, the non-breaching party can sue now, as apparently is the case here, can wait until performance is due and sue later, or can seek further assurances. Here, Tech sought alternate performance, couldn't find it, and filed an action. So the defendant's uh, defense to breach fails. So we've got a valid contract, and it's been breached by the defendant. So now we turn to remedies. And here, the defendant has strong remedies to specific performance, strong enough that I think a very persuasive answer can be written on either side, either ultimately coming out for the plaintiff or for the defendant. 
Now, although I think of myself as being sort of naturally inclined to a pro-defense bias, in this instance, I grant the plaintiff's prayer for specific performance, and I find that data's defenses aren't very persuasive. Obviously, the first line of argument with regard to specific performance is that damages are adequate. The problem for data in this case is that tech has sought alternate performance and couldn't find it. So there is nobody else to perform the uh, installation of this equipment, and therefore legal remedies really aren't adequate to satisfy tech in a breach of contract action. The next defense is a much closer call. The next defense is that it really isn't feasible for the court to order performance or that the court lacks jurisdiction even to order performance because that performance is due outside of the territorial boundaries of the U.S. in the middle of the ocean. And here, I think the power's contempt power over the parties would be enough to assure performance and to provide for adequate sanctions. Furthermore, I don't really think that the court has to be an expert about underwater installations to be able to judge whether or not performance has been properly performed. Next, the defendant can argue that this is a personal services contract and, as such, shouldn't be subject to specific performance out of our refusal to force servitude on a party. Still, it looks to me as if this is primarily a transaction for goods and that the installation is more or less a really complicated delivery provision. I don't think that this is the sort of personal services contract that specific performance has to shy away from. Now here again, I recognize that this is really quite a close call. One could readily grant a defense motion to limit the plaintiffs to damages based on this idea of personal services not really lending themselves to an equitable decree of specific performance. Still, my conclusion overall to this case is that there was a valid contract, that the modification failed, that the breach by anticipatory repudiation entitles the plaintiff to immediate relief, and that that relief is specific performance because performance is not available elsewhere. This is a party that has breached in bad faith in order to try to make more money in the free market, despite its contractual obligations. So my conclusion is that the defendant loses across the board. Interestingly, in this case, the defendant actually does have credible defenses to formation, to breach, and equitable relief. One could write answers that fairly persuasively reach the opposite conclusions that I reach. But I think the most important lesson this question offers is the lesson emphasizing defenses. Remember that a defendant in a contracts case can offer defenses to formation. In this case, they can offer defenses to a modification or to subsequent negotiations. The defendant can offer a defense to breach. And finally, the defendant has defenses to relief both with regard to damages and with regard to equitable relief. Be prepared to consider the defenses any time you're discussing civil litigation.